So basically, we are here because of an odd little project, actually not a little project, but a big project, shared between Continuum and Kettering Foundation, which are two interesting organizations that you probably know one of. Uh, Kettering Foundation is a small, nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that studies what it takes to make democracy work as it should. And by democracy, we're not talking so much about voting or um, uh, you know, elections or things like that, but about citizens and communities being able to solve problems. And we do a lot of field research, and we come from a history of uh, tinkers and inventors. Charles F. Kettering was actually the inventing, inventor of the self-starter for the automobile engine. So that's the kind of tradition of invention and research that we come out of, tinkering and field research. Yeah, and I'm April. I'm from Continuo. Um, my CEO is Luke Coleman, who you probably know well of. Um, and of course, we make serious games for business and other applications. Um, when I say other applications, my mind immediately goes to what the work we do for San Jose. Um, so we do the budget games. And last year, in fact, we actually did our in-person budget game, which was kind of the paper and pen version of it. And then we actually engaged people online uh, for a few days after that, so people from San Jose could weigh in and say, yeah, I want more cops than I need, you know, more firefighters on trucks. Making those layoffs um, and trade-offs with, you know, money on a system online, debating with each other about what their neighborhoods need, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's what we do. Um, and I'm the product manager for Common Ground for Action. So Common Ground for Action is actually the project that we've been working on for over a year, and it's a special kind of decision-making structure in a game um, that it allows people to solve a class of problems called wicked problems. So um, think about what we think of as some of our most difficult problems, putting a man on the moon. How is it that we can put a man on the moon, but at the same time we have a very difficult time making sure solving other kinds of problems, like say, getting water to farmers in California to keep their crops from drying up? How is it that one, you know, getting someone to another part of the solar system uh, can easily be, or not easily be accomplished, but with enough time, will, and money can be done, where there are other kinds of problems that involve collaboration and, uh, and a number of other characteristics that we'll talk about that are super, super difficult to solve. And the reason is because our toughest problems, things like water scarcity, climate change, obesity, our political system itself, lots of these kinds of uh, problems are not just tough, they're wicked. So the, um, the, you guys probably may be familiar with, I know that there's a whole class of software that deals with wicked problems. The term originally actually came out of the uh, public planning field, a couple of engineers named uh, Little and Weber, and they were realizing that while there are perfect optimal solutions to engineering problems, if you're actually trying to deal with a problem where you are trying to solve a problem for multiple space stakeholders with different perspectives, there is no such thing as an optimal solution. Furthermore, you might be working in uh, places where the information itself is contested and there isn't a clear problem definition. Um, and you may, you're probably t talking about things that are, where there are competing underlying things held valuable, meaning that you can't get all of one without giving up some of another. And any attempt to act on the problem would probably uh, have an effect on the problem. So therefore, every time you are trying to address a wicked problem, there's no solution for it. There's just now one more attempt to treat it. And it changes every time so that each wicked problem is essentially novel. So um, there are lots of differing characteristics of wicked problems. Um, like uh, it starts in public policy planning, uh, but then it's since moved on and people have done, have, it's contributed to decision making literature. There is a school of thought at the um, uh, Harvard School of Government about adaptive problems. And so this is actually making it into kind of the fields of governance and things like that. It's in uh, software development as now well or as well also now. Um, and recently there are some other organizations that are um, working on um, uh, what they on a whole typology of problems including super wicked problems, which they consider to be things like climate change, which have all the regular characteristics of wicked problems, but in addition, there's not some over, overarching governing body that would even have the authority to deal with this. So you're definitely gonna require not only um, uh, to collect decision making by multiple stakeholders, but there's also no way of enforcing this and no even convening body to do so. So, tough stuff. Um, just to kind of contrast the difference between a technical and a wicked problem, just I want to go into this a little bit, but not belabor the point. I think it's probably pretty clear to a lot of you guys what the 
differences. But so, you know, a technical problem, we have a clear problem definition. We want to build a bridge that will support this much traffic. What's the best construction material to do? Um, with a wicked problem, the problem definition may be unclear. We want to have affordable housing in San Francisco. But is that it, or is it that we want to have affordable housing while we also have uh, you know, a green city and while we also are supporting growth and staying attractive to business and uh, not you know, losing our tax base? And people's views are not obstructed. So they have this, you know, I paid a lot of money for this house and this land, and I want to see the bay. And people that want to move in want you know, affordable housing. So run the trails. Right. So a problem definition being unclear. And you can see that, especially when the problem definition it can be a contested definition, but it's also probably, there's no shared understanding of exactly what it is. It hasn't been established. It might be, media might call it one thing, uh, political parties might call it another, but there's no shared definition, um, a shared understanding of what the problem is. So a technical problem, you can break it into smaller parts. Go into the moon. If you can you know, get the rockets up and, and break gravity and, and land and then somehow burn enough fuel to come back, that is my super, um, I know we have an astronomer here and I probably just embarrassed myself with that description of <laughs> moon flight. But um, basically, if you can break those problems down and then you can hook them together and then you have your solution. A wicked problem is more like, not like a chain, but like a knot. Uh, the competing underlying things held valuable where if you pull one side, you're gonna cause a worse tangle on the other parts. And again, every time you attempt to solve it, you made the problem a bit naughtier in some other way, so it's changing as, um, as you attempt to work on it. This technical problem, you can have an optimal decision in the first place, and you can determine what it is through facts and logic and rationality. With a wicked problem, there's not necessarily an optimal solution. Um, every solution will have unintended consequences and trade-offs, and everyone, um, and there may also, it has to be a matter of what should be, is a, is a lot of times more normative kind of questions where there isn't necessarily a perfect optimal answer. There isn't a particularly good answer, and even if there was, there's no epistemology that can say, this is the optimal one. And then lastly, so a technical problem, again, think about getting to the middle. Okay, a technical problem is one that if you have ex smart experts with good information, they can solve it. A wicked problem, not so much. It requires action by multiple actors, generally based on shared understanding um, that has to be developed together. That can't just be done by knowledge transfer to people. They have to develop something together and also develop the capacity to act on it. So, uh, so those are a bunch of characteristics of wicked problems. So you can see this is a thorny kind of uh, class of problem that we're trying to deal with. Kettering particularly also works on wicked public problems, which have the same characteristics that we all just talked about, uh, but we're generally talking about wicked shared public problems. So matters uh, where a community or citizens um, or even a nation as a whole have to deal with them. So uh, think about questions. So I'll give some examples in a moment, but they have the four main characteristics of you know, unclarity requiring um, action by a, a bunch of different stakeholders as well as new knowledge uh, being gained by stakeholders together. But the other thing that makes about wicked public problems is that the responsibility for the solution lies at least partially with the public. There may be some element to which we can delegate to policymakers, but there's probably also behavior change or even a new collective, not just individual, but new collective action that needs to be taken by citizens uh, ourselves. So the responsibility for the solution lies at least partially within us. And again, it's normative. These are questions about what should be done, and nobody but we can decide that for ourselves. And so some examples of wicked problems um, are probably some that you can think of as well. But so water scarcity. And what's that? So I don't know if this is the saying, and I know California is having a huge drought right now, which you can see from space. Kettering does some work with some folks in Nevada, and they say that water, wait, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. So that's, I think, um, shows you the, the depth of the water kind of problem that we're having kind of throughout the West. And, um, you can talk a little bit more about this later, but so the water scarcity in California is a huge problem. And the difficulty of dealing with that is that, again, obviously, it's going to require behavior change by multiple different actors. There's not necessarily one uh, you know, right technical solution. I mean, there are probably lots of different scientific technical fixes that can be applied, but no one of them is right, and if they're working at cross purposes, the problem will not actually be addressed. Um, climate change, as we've talked about, 
you know, there's climate change, but it involves underlying uh, things held valuable. Of, so there is, we want to have a safe environment, but we also want to have an economy that is working, and then we also want to be able to have growth. And um, so, a climate, and so this would require climate change would require lots of different people to take different complementary action to all have an effect. There's a collective collective impact problem. Um, because who wants to go first on this kind of thing? And uh, so basically, this a lot of the environmental problems are trying to avoid kind of the tragedy of the commons. Um, a lot of times economic issues, especially when that involve like kind of the, a larger macro behavioral economic piece, are wicked problems. Um, obesity is a, is a great example of a public health problem that's wicked. So there are all kinds of you know scientific information about health that is helpful to know, and things that you can do um, to address your personal, individual, uh, you know, medical health and weight status. But obesity is a, as a public health problem is not something that there's a medical solution for. This is about the kind of communities we have, the kind of wellness programs we have, the kind of walking that we expect people to do, the kind of food that is available for people, the kind of health care that we focus on, and all those things. And then lastly, political corruption, uh, which is actually going to be the subject of uh, our game demo after this, and something I'm sure that we all have lots of thoughts about. It's funny that we're in this hotel, which is named after so many illustrious early members of our democracy, and now we're going to talk about what has gone horribly wrong in the meantime, and, uh, and how we might fix that with the problem. Oh, yes, so. There we go. We've got 90 minutes and a room full of smart people. We ought to certainly be able to do this, right? Yeah? Yeah. I, no. Do you guys catch the joke? I heard those appreciative sniggers and I appreciate it. That's exactly the point. The difference with wicked problems is that even having the smartest people in the room, the smartest people in the world in the room, which I'm sure we have here, even having the, the smartest people, the most um, competent subject matter experts, um, with all the will in the world, is not enough to solve a wicked problem because it's not the class of problem that it is. Um, basically, what Kettering, uh, our formulation is that if the problem is wicked, our solution has to be wicked too. So, um, um, so we come up with some ideas about a wicked, what a wicked solution might be. So we take the characteristics of a wicked problem and then we kind of use the mirror image of that to come up with a wicked solution. And so this is kind of, it looks like we identified the characteristics of the problem and then came up with a uh, corresponding list of things to counteract it. But actually, and we, we noted the differences of the problem, but again, like I said, Kettering's research comes from observation in the field. We noticed citizens and communities who were struggling with problems that had these characteristics, and we noticed and recorded what they did to work around these particular characteristics, and this became the basis of our solution. What I think is so interesting about the project that April and I are working on uh, together is that it comes from an, uh, from a organization that does a lot of observational research and tinkering, um, and and not very much online, and an organization that does really really fantastic strategic design thinking, um, and can also bring that online. So I think it's just a um, a little bit about how we've got the two methodologies that we brought to kind of working on this problem, but. Um, so back to wicked problems. So uh, the problem definition is un if the problem definition is unclear, if that's the big problem, why why dealing with wicked problems is so difficult is because different people are talking about different things. Some people are talking about climate change, and what they really want to do is make sure that climate change doesn't threaten everything, but they basically want to you know keep the economy chugging along without without massive change. Whereas for someone else, this is about you know. Um, earth and, and sustainability for future generations and, and anything that has to change because of that it has to change. That's what we have to do. Getting people to have to at least realize that there are people who see the problem the other way so that we have not, we don't have to settle on one name for it, but that we have a name for a problem that is complete enough and understanding of all the things that people feel is involved with uh, solving the problem. Um, again, uh, so a wicked problem Solving it would involve uh, dealing with over underlying competing things held valuable where you can't get all of everything. Um, so uh, options have, so options for dealing with a wicked problem we have found um, should be derived from those concerns, not from the political parties or not by the media who just says yes or no. Media a lot of times says yes or no, do this or this, or they report on a political horse race. And political parties certainly have, you know, 
the Republican Party is these values, and Democratic Party is these values, and these are what they are. But those may not necessarily ha actually have that much to do with what people are really concerned about. Those are people using the language of values without tapping into what people are necessarily really concerned about. And I think this is why you can actually see a lot of people uh, feeling apathetic about politics, because the values that the parties say that they are really interested in um, you know, promoting aren't really attached to how people connect to those values. Um, so wicked problems, as we said, no optimal solution. Um, so if there is no optimal solution, there's not one best one that, uh, that your strictest logic would help you to get to, what citizens have to do is come together and choose action, make choices together, and, and do that as soundly as they can. Mostly, uh, what we found tends to be missing from that is weighing inherent trade-offs. And then uh, finally, with wicked problems, the problem solution requiring action by a range of actors. So citizens need to have a role in the solution of that. We found that solutions uh, to wicked problems that tend to not have a role for citizens don't actually uh, tend to, to work widely because you have a policy, but you don't necessarily have um, citizen buy-in and action. Yeah, so how do we do this, right? So we've talked about some pretty serious things. So what is the approach that we should take to start breaking these knots down? And what Kettering has found is that these wicked problems need a wicked solution that they call deliberative decision making. So actually talking about things, not arguing about them, kind of what Amy mentioned as far as the way the media likes to frame things. You can turn on two different channels and hear two different versions of actually happening. Um, so the thing is, we need to get together and actually talk about it. And as Amy mentions also, the things held valuable. What does that mean, right? So we'll have a slide that has some examples of this in a minute, but to put in your minds now, it's really the things that make us human, right? We want to be safe, we want to be happy, we want to be free. These things aren't, you know, just you know, tied to a political party, these are things that we all want. And at the end of the day, we can come back to those and start the discussion there instead of, you know, you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican. Um, so talking about things in a manner that's not quite so divisive requires a framework and it requires practice, like any other thing that is worth doing. Yeah, I would say that we call it deliberative decision making, which makes it sound far more like a process, like visioning or you know any other kind of particular um, technique than it actually is. Like I said, Kettering started off by just uh, observing the different kinds of things that communities did to solve problems, and uh, we have kind of called this you know the, the key characteristic of this kind of problem solving tends to be a, an element of deliberation, and so we call it that. Um, but it's we're again trying to make the point that this is you know stuff that you already know how to do. Calling deliberate decision making a process is like calling walking a process. Um, it's just natural practice that everybody already knows how to do, especially individually. All we are finding out is how communities can actually do this together. But I would, but um, it does involve a starting point and a practice. But again, not like a specialized technique. Which is, so the design elements taking it online or where we actually needed to, to think about that and that's where continuum was the helpful. So what is this framework we mentioned? Um, cool. So again the underlying things held valuable. Um, there's also the fact that the framework pushes you to look beyond black and white yes or no. And it typically asks you to do at least three different options. Um, and we'll go into how those are framed in a minute with an example that's near and dear to my heart, and you'll see it in a moment. But three options that aren't, you know, Democrat, Republican, and Independent. Like real options. Um, and within each option, which you can consider um, an overall strategy, there are tactics within it that we call actions. For each action, as you can imagine, there are drawbacks. So something that's kind of missing in, in political discourse right now is the fact that doing these things that we're super excited about and sound really great will hurt someone on the other end. And we have to weigh that effectively to really come up with something that makes sense for everyone. So those trade-offs are hugely important to consider. And that's something that we support in the platform itself as well. Um, yeah, we'll give some more, it's hard to kind of think about these uh, in the abstract too much, but basically, yeah, there are strategies, 
um, within those tactics. And the thing that makes this particularly different is thinking about not only the costs or the disadvantages of a particular action, which most people know to do. You know, you think about that in terms of what's feasible, but also the kind of inherent drawbacks. Like say security um, and freedom in airports. If I really want to uh, be secure and make sure that I actually that there's a very very low possibility of anything untoward happening in an airport, I'm going to have to give up some element of uh, freedom and time and convenience. And even if it works perfectly, I'm not saying that you can't do it because airport security is expensive or, or whatever, or that it wouldn't work because the terrorists will be too smart. But saying let's let's try it, let's accept that we will try to do this and it works. But still, what's the inherent thing that if I have to give up, if I pull on the problem, if I pull on the knot from this way, what else do I tangle up by doing so? Okay, so what she's touching on also is being so valuable. So are we willing to, you know, take off our shoes? to get more of that personal safety and security? What are the things that are you know, inherent in the conversations? You know, do we want to be self-reliant? Do I not want to take off my shoes, but still, you know, you know, the potential of security issues, what's more important to us, right? Um, so the things you see here are the things that make us human, right? So we want to be safe and happy, we want to be treated fairly, these are normal, and I think if you walked up to anyone on the street and said, do you want to um, plan for the future, you're gonna hear pretty much 100% yes, I do. So, relying on these things first, instead of what political party you're affiliated with, is an awesome place to start in a conversation, and it also helps us frame these options, actions, and drawbacks in a way that really pull on you as a person, and, and make you, um, Think about the, the conflicting things within that. All right, so near and dear to my heart, right? So I'm from San Francisco, or I'm living in San Francisco, and as you can see by the picture, the center of the state of California is drying up right now. And 15% of the stuff you eat comes from that valley. Um, us in Northern California, we pump huge amounts of water south so that we can get water to the fields. Um, huge aqueducts, a massive system that covers the whole state to get the water down there. And we're in a serious drought situation. So we're having to really think, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna plant more almond trees, right? So the Mediterranean diet is a huge deal and the farmers are making an insane amount of money on almonds. But <coughs> almond trees require a lot of water to produce, right? So there, the, the picture we showed before is a farmer ripping up his almond trees because he don't have the water to, to give it what it needs to produce. So it's, he's losing money every second that thing is in the ground. So it's, it's pretty bad. And as you can probably guess, we need a um, conversation between lots of different parties here to figure out what's going on. We have to talk to, um, the people that drink the water, the people that use the water, conserve, the people that um, are, are planting, they don't plant super water intensive stuff. Everyone has to come together and talk about this. Otherwise, we're just kind of kind of dry up. It's going to be sad. And if you did some research about this, there are innumerable numbers of scientific papers proffering different ways that water can be managed. There's a whole, um, I did some research about this when we were talking about this. And um, you know, there's a, there's entire uh, agencies within California's uh, state government that are devoted to this and coming up with good water planning. And they're working with universities. The smartest people in probably some of the smartest people in the state are working on this problem because it is crucial. But the fact that they can generate a lot of good information and a lot of good science about this still is is very crucially needed information. Nobody would discount, especially on certain problems like environmental or scientific problems, that you need good experts with good information. But just that it's not enough. There has to be some way for citizens not to just be the recipients of knowledge and just, okay, well, this makes the most sense. I'm, I'm smart enough now to understand that this is the best technical solution. I'm going to do whatever this indicates. Because that's just not the way it works. There has to be some way to mediate that uh, information that's gathered by all these smart people about the, the best ways that are possible for dealing with this, considering on what's valuable. But the only people who can tell us what's valuable um, are the people, are us, citizens ourselves. Okay. And kind of going along with that, I can I can tell you that the governor said, hey, conserve people, for the love of God, conserve. 
but you know, if I was at home right now, I'm pretty sure that the HOA has the sprinklers running. So our, our, our garden is awesome right now. So this needs to be something where we feel the squeeze, right? Because unless we feel the squeeze, we're not going to change. So that leads me to the way we frame things. So you'll notice that the fruit and things that we have here, a couple of them are pretty similar. So we have an apple and an orange, but then we have this potato, right? What's up with the potato? So options one and two are really about acquiring water and bringing it into Silicon Valley in this example. Um, so we can pump it into the, we can get water out of the aquifer. Like we're walking around on it, it's down there, we have to just go get it, right? Um, bring new water in. It's happened to some of the other rivers and things that are out there. You know, the environment might suffer, but hey, we need the water, right? And then option three, which is the massive potato over there, is hey, we can let the market figure this out for us. Um, so I think what it takes like 600 gallons of water or something like that, I need to verify. Um, but a huge amount of water to produce a hamburger, right? But if I pulled up to a McDonald's, I'm gonna get a really awesome, really cheap hamburger. So the value of water is not coming through as the resource that it is. And if I had to pay a pretty penny for that hamburger for my HOA to water along, then we might conserve. That might be um, the, the squeeze that we need, right? So. Oh, oh. And you can imagine that the people who produce hamburgers and other kinds of products who are not currently paying the uh, price for that kind of water might definitely push back against that. You can imagine people who would very much identify with each one of these um, primary kind of concerns. You could also imagine other people who would say, that's not the primary concern, it's something else. So this way of framing it, um, basically um, this apple orange potato framing, it's not like this is a formula for it. There, are, there isn't particularly a formula for doing a framework. Uh, doing an, an issue framing from kind of a, to frame an issue for public deliberation is basically a kind of action research. But we have found from Kettering Foundation has done a number of these framings, hundreds of these framings over the years, um, over about 30 years on these different kind of issues. And we have kind of found certain archetypes that they tend to fall into. And one does tend to be this apple, orange, and potato.